Hey, so as I mentioned, I wanted to come in and talk about The Mirror and the Light. This just missed out on being in the shortlist for the Booker Prize, so people are kind of losing their shit about it. But then I remember seeing comments being like, oh my god, this is so fixed this year, The Mirror and the Light's gonna win. And now that it's off the shortlist, people are still complaining. So you can't really please everyone. But so like people are never pleased, but th maybe this is why people shouldn't go to book prizes to validate their own opinions on books. I'm happy it made the long list. All the time with the booker, like the best book doesn't win and the best books don't make the short list. The best books don't even make the long list. So people need to calm down a little bit. It is nice that the booker can still give me a few surprises. So I don't mind that at all. Speaking of the booker, I am reading how much of these hills is gold, which also missed out on the short list. And I'm only, what is it, 80 pages into it, something like that. So I'm going to do a video on that next week once I've finished it. And I read The Discomfort of Evening, really enjoyed it. So I can't wait to do a video on that for my Sunday Reads video. And at the moment I'm reading Margaret Atwood's poetry. I haven't been reading that much poetry lately really. So I'm enjoying getting back into poetry. And I can't wait to do poetry videos that I want to do in... I'll probably do those in October. And I also finished Shuggy Bane. So I'm going to do a video on that next week as well probs okay i do want to come in and talk about the mirror and the light so this is the final installment in the Cromwell trilogy it is what 800 and just under 880 pages people are saying it's a really really long book but i don't think it is that long really war fall and bring out the bodies are around 500 pages but to me reading this mantel's prose is so flawless that it doesn't feel like you're reading an 800 page novel it feels like you're reading it feels like maybe it's like a 500 page novel like it doesn't feel that long sometimes i read novels that are 460 pages and it feels like you're reading like a 900 page novel and so much actually happens in this novel that it does feel like the pace is quite good i think she manages the length with the structure that she laid down in the earlier book so there's six parts and there's like three chapters for each part more or less so it does move at quite a regular pace. It's not like you're reading like 300 pages in one go. You can manage it in short bursts if that's how you read, or you can manage it in longer bursts if that's how you read. Let's talk about the cover. So I think the cover is lush. I'm wearing gold to match the gold parts. Seeming as it didn't make the shortlist and it's not going to win, I can't really do blue and the turban like I did before. But, you know, gold, gold will do. I like that the green is kind of like fingerprints and I'm not sure what it's meant to be like. I mean, it can't be the Thames because the Thames is brown and disgusting and muddy. It makes me think of the fashionable colours that the court would wear at the time. I do think that it is a beautiful edition and the inside has these gates. So I guess it must be meant to be the River Thames, but the River Thames is nowhere near this nice looking. I guess that is meant to be like the Tower of London in this a lot happened so you go through you know Anne Boleyn's beheaded at the start because that happened at the end of Bring Up the Bodies and then there's you know Jane Seymour and then there's Anne of Cleves and then um, Catherine Howard comes in towards the end you follow Cromwell at the height of his career and then him right at the end tanking a lot of people in their reviews seem to be thinking that, oh my god, I just felt so much for Cromwell, like, you know, as if Cromwell was some kind of softy. But in these books, I'm like, he tortures people, he he bullied people into confessing things that they never did. He's not a soft-hearted man at all. And I think Mantell does manage to balance out the sociopathic side of Cromwell with these more emotional parts. This novel focuses more on the relationship with his son. So because he's, you know, the Privy Seal and he's, you know, tippity top of the court next to Henry VIII, his son is also on a come up in the court. So the son is scared of him. So you see that how he feels about his father, Cromwell's son kind of feels about him. That was really, really interesting. And I like that. In this novel, Henry VIII is increasingly unstable. So I thought it was so well crafted. Um, the sense of instability in this novel, even though you're in powerhouse of the land, you're following Henry VIII's court, there's always the sense of threat. The relations between the countries, Spain and France, 
and never set in stone like one week oh my gosh we're gonna marry mary to philip of spain or his nephew and then the next week they're like um no we would never do that because we need france on our side the fall of cromwell at the end of it and some people feel like oh my god my heart cromwell how terrible that cromwell died. you know you do know he's the reason anne boleyn was beheaded like he did a lot of sketchy shit I am not surprised at all that he ended up, if anything, he's lucky that he ended up with such, you know, a quick death. It seemed like, what did you expect, Cromwell? Like, you've seen how the king treats his staff. Why would you think you would be above that code? The brevity of Cromwell's downfall worked because he falls out of favour so quickly and because he's created this culture in the court where, you know, the king can just be like, no, I don't like you anymore, the headed treason. I thought the figure of Henry VIII in this novel was just so well done. Um, Hilary Mantel never forgets that this is like a really famous king in world history and that even though he was a king, he was a man. So all the contradictions that come into play between him as a historical figure, him and as a man, him as, you know, the head of the church. I thought that she manages to handle those really, really well. Um, because the novel is follows Cromwell mainly, you only see the king through Cromwell's interpretation of him. It felt like such a true way of describing a king in a novel. At some point in the novel, you like really despise Henry VIII. And at other times you are, you do feel that you can understand why he is the way he is. He's the head of the state and all the courtiers, they will only work on what he tells them. Just as much as the courtiers try to wrap Henry around their little finger so that they can rise up in the court they can get a nice manor house or a title. Henry VIII is also manipulating them just as much. And Henry VIII kind of has the last laugh most of the time. So at some point I was like, yes, Henry, stir them up, gas them up and then drop them down, like destroy them. They deserve to be destroyed because they're just so nakedly ambitious. Why shouldn't, you know, why shouldn't they get their comeuppance? What Mantel also tackles in this novel is the unrest of the public as well. So. What I thought was missing in Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies was the peasant revolts that were happening. But in this novel, those do happen. So I did like that. I felt that that was a very faithful interpretation of history, that there's always these grumblings and there's points where changes happen and then they build to breaking point. And I thought the way that Hilary Mantel uses language was just so good at conveying that. So here we go. Word spreads. On the farms around, labourers see the chance of a holiday. Faces blackened, some wearing women's attire. They set off to town, picking up any edge tool that could act as a weapon. From the marketplace, you can see them coming, kicking up a cloud of dust. Old men anywhere in England will tell you about the drunken exploits of harvests past. Rebel ballads sung by our grandfathers need small adaption now. We are taxed till we cry. We must live till we die. We be looted and swindled and cheated and dwindled. Oh, worse was it never. Farmers bolt their grain stores. The magistrates are alert. The bell ringers, elbowed and threatened, tumble into the parish church and ring the bells backward. At this signal, the world turns upside down. This, this whole sense of the uncertainty of the future clashing with what people think as the, you know, the sturdier past. And really Mantel is saying that the past is just as unstable as the future, so it's always like this crickety wheel that just keeps on rolling and rolling and rolling that no one knows what to do with. So I thought it was brilliant how Mantel always uses language as a finely tuned instrument and a tool. And the way she uses short sentences, I just adored. I thought it was like her building up Henry VIII's court brick by brick, only to like knock it down and be like, yeah, that was it. It was always an unstable structure that could have been crumbled at any moment. And I thought that um, the way Hilary Mantel wrote about the women in the novels was really interesting. In the wake of Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour feels like a really kind of flaccid wife and like, oh, she's just extremely submissive to Henry Dick because she's like, he kind of could kill me at any moment otherwise. But you get the sense that Jane Seymour was kind of just really clever at playing her role. So a lot of times Jane Seymour, she'll do things that seem like she's trying to break out of this little mold she's created for herself and she'll she'll try to say to Henry oh actually you know this is why the peasants are revolt and then her ladies in waiting just kind of hoist her out and take her out of the room like uh, no Jane you don't get to say anything and then Henry says something like maybe once you've given me a son then I'll listen to you even though the women are kind of pawns used by these men 
Mantel always gives their character a complexity that highlights the ever submissive role they have to play with the limitations of their identity and their own wants and desires. But now I am wondering what Hilary Mantel is going to do next. I would love to see her write a historical novel based on Elizabeth I, because I just think she was a fascinating historical figure as well. But um, I don't know if she will do that. Do you know where she plans to go next from here? Um, I do want to read more of Hilary Mantel, and I really want to read her memoir, Giving Up the Ghost. OK, so what did you think about The Mirror and the Light? And how do you feel about it being on the Booker Prize or not being on the Booker Prize anymore? Let me know. All right. Thank you. Bye.